Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to episode three of Beyond the Bell Tower. I'm your host, Joshua Wright, and I'm so excited to be on once again today to, to give a sense of encouragement to these students. Uh, today, we have the distinguished Dr. Rupert Nikos. Did I say that right? Yes. I did, yes. Dr. Nikos, he's a professor here at NC State. I've been lucky enough to be in a couple of his classes now um, as a senior psychology major, and he's in the psychology department as well. Um, currently, I'm in his uh, Psych 411 class, um, the psychology of interdependence and race, and it's, it's been a great semester with him. So I'm excited to have him on, and I'm happy to introduce him. Now, go ahead and feel free to say hello, Dr. Nikos. Well, thanks for having me, Joshua. It's, it's good to be here. Uh, I'm excited to hear the questions and be able to respond. Yeah, yeah, we're excited to have you on. I, I promise you all you're going to enjoy this one. This is a special treat, and we're thankful to have him on today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Let's get started. Could you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, brace for impact, everyone. <laughs> Tell us where you're from and, and, and okay. how you got to where you are now. Okay, so one of the things about me that sometimes surprises people, even Black people, uh, is when I say that I'm a Louisiana Black Creole. What does that mean? It means they throw us say bon, les les bon tendu les. I am from the Louisiana Bayou country. That's why my last name is not Nakosti, as some people say, but it's Nakos. I am Dr. Rupert Nakos from the Bayou country, not New Orleans. No, 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 no. Bayou, swamps, alligators, that kind of thing. Uh, I grew up in the in the Bayou country, joined the Navy after uh uh, high school, well, high school and a bit of college, uh, spent four years in the United States Navy, uh, and then came back to higher education to work on my uh, graduate, my undergraduate degree, and then my PhD okay. in social psychology. I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a social psychologist. My focus is interpersonal interactions of all sorts. So tell me a little bit about some of your favorite things you know, from the beginning, some of your favorite things about, you know, growing up there in Louisiana, uh, specifically your hometown. And because uh, I remember one, one interview I did with, with you, you know, we talked about, you know, the difference between where you're from and how people, when they think of Louisiana, they think of New Orleans, but you want to, you wanted to be very specific. So tell us very some specific. of the favorite things about growing up where you're from. Well, like I say, I grew up in the Bayou country. So what does that mean? It means uh, alligators and swamps, it means I grew up in a family that went into the bayous to fish, to hunt. Uh, it means that we ate certain kinds of food that people in North Carolina never heard of. Uh, for example, etouffee, a squirrel, uh, bird gumbo, uh, all kinds of stuff that people uh, in North Carolina don't think of. Uh, and it's not New Orleans. Uh, People get confused because, for example, the, the New Orleans Saints, they say, who that? Who that say they're going to beat them Saints? As if that's a New Orleans Saint, and it's not. That's from the Bayou Country people, the Creoles who talk that way. Who that come to my house? Who that? So they kind of stole that from the Bayou. Um, favorite things are those things, the, the growing up, uh, hanging out uh, in the Bayou, fishing, hunting, uh, being with the family, being with my cousins. Uh, a bunch of crazy people. <laughs> uh, that's it was wide open country in in a, in you know I'm I'm from I'm rural. Uh, people don't when they see me as a distinguished professor they don't think I come from a rural area but I really do. No city in my background. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, and so you talked a little bit before about um, how you spent some time in the Navy. So can you go into that a little bit? Um, how did you get to the Navy and some lessons that you learned coming out of it and what kind of position you had while you were in the Navy? So here's what happened. I graduated from high school, one of the smart kids going off to college. But in college, I didn't find my way. I, uh, I was supposed to do computer science and math, and I could do that, but I was bored to tears. And so bad stuff started to happen. I started to just not go to class. I started drinking and I realized I, uh, I can't keep doing this. I got to get out of here. So that's how I ended up in the Navy. I joined the Navy, kind of following in my brother's footsteps, my older brother. 
Uh, and so I joined the Navy kind of on a fluke uh, and ended up uh, being trained as a personnel clerk uh, and serving on board aircraft carriers. But I also served during a time in the Navy that was really, really tough for race relations. The Navy was going through a transition. Uh, the Navy was the most recalcitrant when it came to desegregation. They resisted desegregation for a long, long time, well after the Army had already integrated people. Uh, so when I was in 1972, it was the transition was really just starting. And so there was a lot of racial tension. Uh, white sailors did not want black sailors like me to have rank. But I'm, I'm a smart person, so I got ranked pretty fast. Uh, and that caused tension for at least the shipboard personnel to see me walking around with stripes on. Uh, and, the, and what was really, what was most intense on an aircraft carrier, an aircraft carrier carries 5,000 men. Some of the new ones carry 8,000. Now imagine this, in, in, in the 8,000 now, they're women, but in my day, it was only men. 5,000 men cramped into a space, some black, some white, and there's tension. Well, <laughs> that, yeah, that's not good because the Navy had not figured out a way to do it well because they had resisted for so long. So what happened? Race riots. I was on board the, the USS Intrepid, January 1973, when a race riot broke out. A race riot on board an aircraft carrier. Weapons of mass destruction all around. Oh my God. And we weren't the only ship that happened on. There were 350 major racial incidents in the Navy from 1970 to 1975. I served from 1972 to 1976, so I caught all of that. Uh, and so the Navy had to do something because you can't have a force that's supposed to protect the nation fighting it, fighting each other. So the Navy created a program uh, that required all sailors, officers, and enlisted to go through two and a half days of racial sensitivity training. And one of the innovations was that they, in, they trained enlisted personnel, enlisted men, to, be, to facilitate those conversations, those sensitivity sessions. In the end, I got trained, I got picked and trained to, do, to be a facilitator. And that's how I discovered social psychology because it was all social psych. I didn't know that at the time, but later I learned where all this came from, what we were doing in facilitating racial dialogues on board a ship. Uh, and so what did I learn? I learned uh, the importance of facilitating dialogue. I learned the importance of there having, there being dialogue uh, when there's group tensions. Uh, and I learned that institutions have to take real action for anything to change. I got rank, I traveled the world. Uh, there was all those experiences as well. It was in the Mediterranean twice, uh, one, on, one time on board the U.S. Intrepid, second time on board the USS Independence. So I have been, as they say, I've traveled the world. Uh, Spain, Greece, Italy, uh, Portugal. Uh, and I was a 22, 23 year old black boy in all those places. Yeah, it was something else, it was something else. And that of course becomes part of who I am. The worldliness that people pick up from me. When I say I'm from the country, they're like, no, you're not. It's like, okay, <laughs> you don't understand how this works. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm still from the country, but I have traveled the world. Wow. So. That's amazing. And so you mentioned earlier about how um, you were a black man on a white ship with um, esteem. You, you were given rank and you talked a little bit about how others felt about it. You know, you, you getting that rank. But how did you feel? You know, and, you know, you sent a, a sense of hostility from your crewmates on the ship there, um, especially, you know, the, the white crewmates that you had. So what was your reaction to that? You know, That's very interesting. That's a really interesting question. Yeah. So the other part of my background you have to understand is my family. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a grassroots politician, uh, uneducated man, barely a high school education because of discrimination. 
My mother got her, uh, did her GED and then got a teaching degree after a while. But the force in my family was our, was our father. Uh, he was a political grassroots politician. Uh, and that meant he had to go out into the white world during the time when people didn't even want black people to vote and push for political change, putting candidates for My father ran for office in Opelousas, Louisiana in 1966. Wow. Yeah. And our home was attacked, physically attacked. Bricks thrown through the windows. So that background meant that I had to, I learned from my father how to keep my balance. The stuff's gonna happen. People are gonna come at you. Uh, and so you have to keep your balance so that you don't lose what you've already gained. And so how did I respond to that? You've heard me say this in class, that sometimes when you're in, in an interaction, you realize you, the best thing to do is what? Walk the hell away. Just walk away. What are they gonna do? What are they gonna do? And if you, if you attack a superior officer in the military, oh, no, you're gone. I had, a, I had a young white man new to our personnel office and he thought, realized that I was the supervisor. And he said he wasn't gonna work for no, and he used the word. I said, really? I said, okay, this is the deal. This is my office. You report to me. I assign you tasks. He said, I'm not going to do it. I said, okay. I just called the master at arms. He was out of the Navy within two days. Yeah. So. That's, power. that's power right there. Get him out of here. <laughs> See, but that's the thing. You have to understand the structure you work in. And I understood the structure I work in. He was coming at me with this kind of personal attack because of my race. But I wasn't going to do that. So this is the deal. This is how it works. This is the military. He said, no. I said, okay. And then he was gone. Because hmm. no matter what, in the military, even people who didn't want me to have rank knew that I had rank, and they knew if they let that pass, other crap was going to start to happen in the chain of command, and you can't have that. Wow. So I also learned how to use systems. Uh yeah, and most of my, okay, let me be clear about this. Most of my comrades, uh, my colleague, my comrades in arms in, the, in my unit, in my squadron, they were fine with me getting rank. Uh, they, 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 because I, I could help them. That was part of it. But it was people outside of the squadron on uh, shipboard people who, who had more of the issues or people walking the base uh, who didn't know uh, who this big giant black man was and, and why he had so much rank. Right. So uh, I had a close knit unit of a mix of people, uh, black, white, uh, Filipino. Uh, uh, so you have to build your network as well. Yeah. Okay. And so you mentioned earlier the, the balance that you were taught as a young kid, as a young boy. Yeah. and how it translated to your experience in the Navy. Do you think that's something that's still important to you now? You know, as Oh, a absolutely. Man, yeah. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a distinguished professor, but that doesn't mean people, <laughs> people know how to deal with that. <laughs> right. Right. So, you know, I've had new colleagues who, did, who didn't quite get it. My other colleagues pulled them aside and said, okay, wait. <laughs> yeah. That's not somebody you want to mess with. Yeah. And you know, I kind of, I kind of got a sense of that in my my first class with you. It was over. It was over. Um, I want to say the fall of 2020. I was a sophomore, beginning of my sophomore year, and it was the social psychology. I think it was 311. I forget the number. And really, um, as soon as you yeah, started okay, the call, you you started with "Good afternoon," as, like you always do. And I kind of got a sense after that first call what kind of what kind of professor you were and the power that you had and. You know, you weren't a joke, but the class was going to be really interesting, of course, just because of how engaging, engaging you are as a professor. So that was my kind of first glimpse at it myself. But you do get, you do feel that sense, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, I use that because look, I know where I teach. Yeah. So when I was, you know, teaching face to face in Poe 216, I walk into the room of 200 students. I know there's some white student in there who's thinking, oh, there's a teaching me. So when I walk in, I go. 
<laughs> yeah. Wake the up. room yeah. is mine. Yeah. Demand the room. So okay. you use the resources you have, the, the position you have. Great. So now let's get into that a little bit. You know, your transition to the um, professional. I know you, you went to school after the Navy, right? You right. Exactly. Navy. Okay. Okay. And so let's get into that a little bit. Um, you talked about where your interest in social psychology came from. Um, can you can you tell me if you were always interested in having a role of teaching or being a professor? Oh, that's interesting. So when I got out of the Navy, I knew I wanted to understand uh, this discipline of social psychology better. And I knew I wanted to do something with this whole group facilitation thing. That's what I thought anyway. So I go to the University of Florida because they had a social psych program. And I was in Florida coming, getting out of the Navy. Uh, and taking social psych courses, my first social psych course, interestingly enough, the professor was a black man, which, wow, uh, a Harvard PhD in social psychology. Wow. So I, of course, latched onto him like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and he understood, he understood, he, he, yeah, he let me bother him. Uh, he became my mentor and we talked a lot about how social psychology worked, what the real focus was. And I began to see that it was a research discipline that could be applied in certain ways. And so that expanded my goals. In fact, he was one of the people who said, you know, you should work on getting a PhD. And there were other of his colleagues who said the same thing, who weren't black about uh, because I was taking a lot of courses and so people were noticing me and saying hmm you really get this you really get this and so I developed uh, so I developed some mentors uh, who helped guide me towards the towards the, the PhD uh, work and then in my PhD work I had an advisor who was also a former military uh, World War II vet uh, he was a high-level intellectual, John Tebow, but he also had the military experience. So he, we kind of connected, and he became the person who really shaped me as a social psychologist in terms of systematic thinking. Uh, so it was all along the way I've had mentors that uh, in my life, and that's very important. Yeah, you briefly mentioned how um, your professor at the University of Florida kind of explain to you, you know, why you should get a PhD. Mm -hmm. And so really quickly, for those that may be listening in the psychology world that are kind of deciding between the master's and the PhD, um, if they decide to go the grad school route, of course, can you talk about, you know, the importance that you, that you were taught behind the, the PhD a little bit? Uh-oh. Sure. Sure. Um... What my, what my mentors were noticing was the level of analytic thinking that I was doing or able to do. And if you're going to go for a PhD, a PhD is a research degree. Uh, you become a high level researcher. So you have, to you have to be interested in that. You have to be interested in doing research. You can't think I'm going to do all this. Other. No, it's research. That's what a PhD is. And because when you go to graduate school at the PhD, you're going to be taking nothing but research courses, research and theory. That's it. That's it. And so that's one of the big differences. Now, I use that in my own way, but I had to go through all that training so that I could use it in my own way. Okay, cool. Appreciate that. Um, so back to kind of your professionalism and, and how you got to where you are now. I know in the stories that I've heard and that you've, you've told us before, you kind of took different stops at different institutions. And um, you don't have to go into each institution and your experience there, but can you just talk about the overall, um, the importance that you think all of those experience taught you and how, you know, having those institutions in your background could have uh, possibly made you a better professor? Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things I learned going through different institutions, University of Michigan, Auburn University, uh, University, of, well, starting early, University of Florida, I learned to get a, a big picture view of higher education. Uh, and so I, I, I learned how the system of higher education works, and it works in different ways at different places. 
So when I came to NC State, I didn't expect NC State to be like Auburn University. I knew I had to learn some things about how this place worked. So all those other experiences gave me that sense of, okay, you got to investigate. You're a professor for sure, but there's other stuff going on that you need to understand uh, to be successful here. So those experiences really did uh, help me uh, be ready and know what to look for. All right. Sounds good. So Dr. Nacoste here was the first Vice Provost of Diversity and African American Student Affairs here at um, NC State. So as the first um, Vice Provost of the African American Student Affairs, what exactly um, was your role and how did it relate to um, the relationships that you had with students here? Okay, so first off, it wasn't Student Affairs. Student Affairs, okay. Is Vice Provost for Diversity and African American Affairs. Oh, okay. Okay. It's not connected to student affairs at all, it turns out. The idea was to have an office that focused on the academic mission and uh, faculty and how colleges operated when it came to diversity and inclusion. I was the person to push and prod and get people moving in new directions. Of course, I had contact with students uh, because that's part of the academic mission. And that was part of the interesting thing, helping colleges and uh, deans uh, stop looking at things from this big picture perspective and say, what about your students? That's what diversity and inclusion is about, how how you help those students interact in respectful ways with each other. What are you doing? You know, just you know, you you can bring people in, but then are they successful? Uh, are they do they feel accepted? Do they feel belong? A sense of belongingness, uh, and that's what I pushed. Uh, but I have to tell you, it was a difficult time because it was a big change. There had never been a vice provost for diversity in African American affairs, and I had power, which freaks some people out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and interestingly enough, it freaks. Yes, it did freak some, some white faculty out, some white deans out, but it also freaked out some black people on this campus. Okay. Uh, because they said, I wanted to change things too fast. They didn't, I didn't want to do things the way they wanted it to keep doing it. Take, for example, the big tension point with Af- the African-American community was the African-American Cultural Center. Mm-hmm. At that time, nobody knew it was there. Mm-hmm. And that's the way they wanted it to keep it to themselves. It was almost like a clubhouse. I was like, hmm, that's not the point. And me saying that's not the point and then starting to say, it's gotta be connected to the academic mission, all hell broke loose. (laughs) Uh, It's different now, it's changed now. But back then it uh, it was a wasted resource. And I pushed on that. But I was pushing the whole campus in new ways. So trust me, uh, there were a lot of people who were trying to bring me down. A lot of different people. Yeah. So you talked about how this power and the role that you had kind of um, made a lot of people see you in different ways, right? Um, Not just students, but your faculty too, or your colleagues too. And that's one thing that stood out to me when you were explaining it in class, how, you know, the different conversations that you had with your colleagues and how they saw you in a different way too. So can you talk about, you know, how you might have, you know, held these conversations with your colleagues in terms of, you know, them maybe thinking you're pushing things too fast? What was your response to that? I always put it in the context of what the university said it wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I removed it from myself. So you've got got a mission statement that says- Right, (laughs) yeah. Diversity. Yep. So it's not about me. This is about what the university says it, it, it stands for and wants to do. So the question is, are you saying you don't stand for that and you don't want to do that? You see what I just did? <laughs> Again, attaching it to the systems, attaching it to the structure I'm living in. And so that, you know, pushed people back and it made them realize they had no leg to stand on. That doesn't mean they weren't, they were going to go along with it right away, but it it also meant that they just did not know how to manage dealing with me if they 
kept that perspective of we got to you're going too fast. Okay. And so the conversations uh, moved in all kind in, in interesting directions, especially with deans, the deans in particular, because the deans set the tone for their colleges. And at that time, literally, it was all white men. That was it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they, they, you know, they had a, you know, a way of talking. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, well, I'm not putting up with that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and I would tell people that that's just bullshit. And they're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can see you saying that now. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I would remind them. I said, hey, 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 hey. Maybe you've been in the academic world all your life, but not me. I'm a military veteran. I ain't got time for bullshit. Okay. And that, yeah. that would shift things because they knew they had to talk to me in a real way. Not all that, hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. You know, no, 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 no. We're going to talk. Well, I'm out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I also had to deal with, uh, also had to deal with a chancellor that was completely freaked out by diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, Marianne Fox. Holy moly. She was so scared of diversity. It was amazing. It was amazing to watch this person who was the chancellor just kind of curl up into a ball when I would walk into the room to talk to her. She just, whoa, it was awful. <laughs> yeah. It was awful. But the problem with that was she was supposed to be setting the tone. So I pushed. Like I said, I pushed everybody. Um, so let's move in now a little bit to um, your role as a professor here. You teach um, quite a few classes, and I've been lucky enough to sit in uh, quite a few of them. Yeah. Uh, I notice this every time we're, you know, signing up for the classes and then ordering our books. A lot of times you put in the books that you've written yourself. And that's oh. one thing that I find so unique about, you know, signing up for your courses. These are books that are written by you. Uh, so can you talk about... Um, Maybe your favorite book that you've written. Uh, I know Ooh. the one that we're reading now in the <laughs> Interdependence and Race course. It's really interesting to me because it goes beyond, you know, definitions and theories and explanations. But you add in, you know, your experiences in Louisiana, in graduate school with your mentor. Um, I, and I love that about the book. So can you talk about some of your favorite things that you've written? I'll talk about two of the academic ones. One you just described, interdependence and the one for interdependence and race. What rough beast. Yeah. What rough beast. It's our come round at last. So poetry, right? Uh, you've heard me use poetry in lectures. Uh, and that book I wrote, What Rough Beast for Interdependence and Race, I wrote that because there was nothing out there that fit the way I teach this course. And so I needed something that fit. And so I spent a year uh, writing a book for specifically for this course. And then let me tell some stories. I, I always want to be able to tell stories. Uh, that's part of my Louisiana culture, uh, storytelling, uh, but I'm storytelling with a point, storytelling that connects, that helps people see concepts in this case. The other book I really like is Taking On Diversity, which I've not used in a class, but is based on my uh, class, Interdependence and Race. I use quotes from student papers in the past because the papers were more extensive back then. Uh, and because they're stories, my students had to analyze a story from their own life uh, that was interpersonal, intergroup. Uh, and I pulled those, uh, a lot of those stories together in my book, Taking on Diversity. And it, it walks people through the idea of neodiversity, the idea of students struggling with various aspects of neodiversity. That is, some students struggling with the fact that they just learned a friend is gay. Some students struggling with the fact that they just learned their friend is atheist. Some, you know, so that's a fun thing to write because the students' stories are so authentic. Uh, and I can help people, I can use that to help people see what America is struggling with. So those two in particular. Okay, sounds good. And um, and then also, you you created or you started the interdependence and race course, correct? You said it right the first time. I created it. You created it. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So 
what went behind that? You know, why why did you um, create that? Why why did you go and start this class? Yeah. So after my experience in the uh, the vice provost position, I, I was in I was a vice provost for only two years. But in those two years, I learned a lot about what students were struggling with uh, on a campus that was rapidly changing. Uh, as you've heard me say in class, when I first got here in 1988, I don't think I ever saw a hijab. You can't see that now. And I could see it happening. And I was trying to, as a vice provost, get the university to see, look, this is happening. And you've got to help students be ready for this or figure out how to deal with it in a respectful way on campus. So when I got out of the vice provost position, I did some writing. Uh, I wrote a memoir called Making Gumbo in the University to talk about that experience. But I also went back to teaching. And as I was teaching, I was seeing it in my classroom, the, the struggle. Students walk into Psych 311 and Po 216 on the first day of fall semester and completely freak out when they look out and see, oh my God, there are black people in here, there are Hispanic people in here, there are white people in here, there are, ah! <laughs> <laughs> my God, a Muslim. Anyway, so then I realized okay, we're not, the university is not helping them, but I'm a social psychologist. I understand the dynamic. I, had, I know the theories behind the dynamic of interpersonal interactions. And that was it. I said, I'm gonna work out a course. And I started doing that. I spent a year figuring out what I would do, how I would set it up. And then I first taught it as an experimental course, but only like 25 students in it. But that first semester was really helpful because I asked my students in the class, what am I doing wrong? What hurt? What works? What else could I do? And they were very forthcoming. So I learned a lot that first semester from the students. See, that's that's how I work. That's how I teach. I'm not going to teach my students from on high. I don't do that. Doesn't make any sense. For example, you've heard me talk about you. You've heard the lecture. Uh, about dating. Dating motivations are all over the place nowadays. So what are the goals of dating nowadays? I ask my, my classes. What are the goals of dating? Now, I could in my 60s say, I think these are the goals of dating. What does that have to do with your life? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. I mean, nothing. The first time I did it, what are the goals of dating these days? I was blown away with what students said. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> but I use that. I use what students are struggling with in my classes. The other one, why are the personal relationships so difficult to manage? I have answers to that theoretically, but that's not the point. So I asked the class, and every semester, it's like, wow, <laughs> look yeah. at that. Yeah. And then I, and you know, I use those responses throughout the semester. Yeah. The rest of the semester, every now and then I'll say, and you said, this makes relationships difficult. And that connects to, and here we go. Yeah. I really like how you include the, the, the ideas of, you know, us young college students. You know, I feel like um, you devote almost a, a class period just going over some of the stuff that we responded with. And that was cool just knowing how, you know, people my age, you know, think compared to how I think and you know, what we agree on, what we disagree on. I think that's really important too. Um, so I really enjoyed that about your, your courses. That's good to hear. One of the things about doing that in independence and race under these conditions is it's a little more difficult because when I have my students, as you know, read Tim Tyson's Blood Doesn't Sign My Name, I you write reaction papers. Well, in pre-pandemic years, we'd have a discussion in class and you would get to hear what people wanted to reveal. You can't do that over Zoom. Yeah. So I have to spend a long weekend reading those papers, pulling excerpts from those papers, and then using that as the lecture. But I think it's so important for you to hear how other students are reacting to that reading, how they're reacting to learning about the real history of race in America. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's definitely important. Um, and so now I kind of want to shift into a topic that I wanted to touch on today. 
um, it's about Black faculty retention here at NC mm. State. And for a little bit of context, for those of you who are listening, uh, this article that I'm that I'm about to um, explore really went into what's going on here at NC State in terms of our retaining a retainment of Black faculty. And then went into some different um, some thoughts and some ideas that people have as of why we may be struggling with that a little bit. And we're not going to touch on every thought, but I kind of want to, um, but the article did touch on, um, you know, not being able to climb up the ladder, um, being used as a heavy support system for minority students, which is a good thing, but uh, it touched on, you know, maybe a little bit of too much of an expectation, you know, uh, to do that for some students because of the lack of diversity in the faculty, there's only a few that some students feel like they can talk to. So that's really what the article went into a little bit. And so I really want to explore your mind, Dr. Nikos, on um, this article. Uh, as a Black faculty member, do you feel that your work here at NC State is, is valued by, you know, um, by North Carolina State University? That's a more complex question than you might realize. So I've got two answers to that. Okay. Uh, most of my departments, yes. They definitely value what I do. They tell me they value what I do. Sometimes they say they're amazed by what I do, all that. The re but does higher administration appreciate it? Kinda. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not always clear. Now I've won all the awards. Uh, that the administration gives, but that's not the same thing as feeling supported by the higher administration. Because a lot of those awards come because students say, you need to give him an award. <laughs> <laughs> so we speak up for you, yeah. Oh, that's, oh, it's amazing, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I have to tell my students, okay, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I think, and, and I'm unique I have to admit that I'm unique because of my military experience and my and growing up in the Jim Crow South. So my expectations are a bit different than, let's say, new African American faculty. Uh, there's a funny thing. I don't know how to say this without sounding crass. That I don't, didn't come here expecting to be appreciated, but that's a generational right. perspective. Young faculty members come expecting to be appreciated. And so, for example, in psychology, we lost a very, a very good, effective, outstanding African-American female professor. She just said, screw it, I'm leaving. It's because of that vague, and I've, higher education is very vague about feedback anyway for faculty. But I think they've not shifted enough to deal with a new generation, and especially a new generation of uh, African American and other um, uh, underrepresented uh, group members, because they come with a different orientation and different set of expectations. They know they're good, and they know they want that to be appreciated right off, and it isn't always. So what do you think it is, this, this expectation, the, the uh, differences in expectations, say, that you came with in 1988 and the ones that are uh, newer that are coming in with, in with now? So I knew I was good, mm -hmm. but I didn't expect that to be rewarded right away. I didn't okay. expect people to really give a shit. Okay. I just knew I need to do my work and do it well. Uh, that's not the expectation some people come with. They come with the expectation that people are gonna notice them right away. Uh, but higher education is funny about that, but you add on to that for African-American and other underrepresented group members, this burden of, uh, extra burden of advising students of color, women, gays and lesbians and so on. Uh, that can that combination I think can wear people out. Hmm. So that combination being not sure they're being appreciated, but all this work is coming to them. I mean, I, I tell young African American uh, faculty, I said, you got to learn how to say no right away because people coming for you, baby. 
they're not coming because they they're coming because of their need, but that doesn't mean you can fulfill everyone's needs. And so the article kind of also went into um, the feeling that black faculty members have here of not really being able to climb the ladder, um, so to speak, in terms of their careers here at NC State. And so in today's world, can you talk about the importance of you know offering opportunities um, to advance the careers of black faculty? Well, oh, it's interesting. Okay, so advance your career. So the first thing is whether or not your tenure track, mm -hmm. uh, because that's the traditional way of advancing your career. You get tenure, you become an associate professor, then you move from that to a full professor eventually with tenure. Uh, now, some people, see, this is the thing. So that's, that's the traditional way of being successful for a faculty member. Now, one of the things that's going on in higher education is a lot of People who are the people who students think are faculty members aren't really faculty members. Right. They're teaching faculty, which is not a tenure track. Okay. So there is no advancement for them. Right. Because that's that's already at the top, right? Once you're tenured. When you're tenured. So there's no advancement for those people who come as teaching faculty only. Okay. So people call them professors, but they're not really. Mm. Uh, so if you start taking people of color and putting them in that category, they're not going anywhere. They're not, they, they're not, they have no influence on campus. They get to teach. That's it. So that's something people don't fully understand about higher education. So if you're tenure track, then you get tenure, you become associate, you become full. Some people want to then go from that to be administrators. Not everybody wants to be an administrator because that's not necessarily an advancement. I never wanted to be an administrator. I got pushed, pulled, prodded, beat up on. <laughs> and I'm glad I did it, but it was not my intention. And uh, I didn't do it until after I became a full professor. So the opportunities, it depends on what you're talking about and what you really, and how people are situated in the structure of, of the institution. I think what's happened recently with people who've left is they, they I'm thinking of, it doesn't matter who I'm thinking of. They've gotten better opportunities with tenure at another, at another university. That happens in higher education all the time. What's interesting is it's happened, it's been happening a lot with African-American faculty. And that's because African-American faculty on our campus have been very good and other universities want them. And we've not done anything to hold them here. My good friend, Dr. Craig Brookins, who created what was the African-American, Africana Studies program, uh, just left. Mm -hmm. He wanted to work on community engagement. They gave him a kind of position here. He said he wanted more. They said, no, we're not doing that. They kept saying, no, we're not doing that. And then he got a job offer <laughs> uh -oh. from Michigan State. And then they said, okay, we'll do it. He was like, wow. no, no, no. You treat me like that? And he left. Hmm. So it's too backhanded. It's not, it doesn't have, there's a lack of vision that has impact more on African-American and other underrepresented groups than on the rest of the faculty. And so um, one last piece that the article mentions, that the article talks about, is there's a sense of an invisible labor that Yo. Black faculty face here at NC State. Um, not only are they full-time faculty members in teaching and conducting research, but they're also, they end up being, you know, informal mentors to minority students across campus. Um, would you say this is a mutual feeling among your Black colleagues at NC State? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, uh -huh. <laughs> so as soon as I said invisible labor, your eyes kind of lit up a little bit. What, oh, what, yeah. you, what do you think of when I, when I say invisible labor? What does that mean to you? Oh, what it means is, okay, so uh, for example, in psychology, we all have a, a number of students who we are automatically academic advisors for. Right. Uh, but then there's a whole nother level of <laughs> Right. Of people who come to my office who want to talk, who want to 
understand, who want help, who want. So when I and I teach, you know, I teach big classes, right? Go to sixteen. So you know, I walk in and I start doing what I do. You can imagine the number of African American students who stay after class. Mm -hmm. uh, first, they're intimidated. They're like, Oof, "Wow!" But then they say, "Okay, I got to talk to this guy." So then there's that. And so how do you navigate all of that as you're trying to go home? <laughs> you just want to go home. Yeah. 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 But that's exactly what that's that's what the article was referring to in, in terms of which students or, you know, or how many students you really give that source of mentorship to. Because yeah. you mentioned even yourself as a college student at the University of Florida. You oh, at see, that. exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So I understand it. I understand yeah. it. But the two things. One is I understand it, so I go with it. You know, I do I do what I call a lot of walk by mentoring. Uh, used to anyway, pre pandemic. You know, I could see a black kid in, in Poe Hall just kind of standing around. I just walk up to him and go say, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> What's your major? Why are you here? What's going on? Ha! Ah! Okay, so I do some of it to myself. <laughs> but then students come at me as well in a good way. Uh, so I understand that. What I what the pro the problem is, not that people don't want to do it. The problem is that people want either some help doing it or reward for doing it. And that's where the university just misses the po misses it all together. Mm -hmm. So we need more uh, people from underrepresented groups walking around the campus who are in tenure track positions or certainly who are in uh, administrative roles with some power and who can help mentor students. We need more of that, we just do. Uh, and it's not just, it's, it's okay, it's not just uh, people of color and underrepresented in that way, but you know, we have gay and lesbian students, we have Muslim students, we have, okay. So the campus, the university has a history of being all white, but it's no longer all white. It's not even really predominantly white, it's kind of white, but, <laughs> but given that you need to build some resources in for this new social environment. Uh, because you wear people get worn out. Yeah. I mean, okay, look, it's really crazy in a certain way. And I, I do understand it, how students will sometimes see me leaving the building and just come walking up to me and start talking. I say, okay, we, I'm going to my car, but come with me. They think you know? you're the man. That's all it is. They think you're the man. Yeah. I'm just trying to go home. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get out. Yeah, I understand that's all, just like anybody else, but there's that added sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now, so, some white white colleagues don't understand that. Some don't, because they will just ignore them. It's like, oh, really, <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So it's a, it's a different vibe. Um, before we get into this last segment, and I'll let you go, I want to go over a quote that I read in an article um, from Dr. Ivory A. Um, Tolson. And um, she's a, a counseling psychology professor at Howard. And she says, a much needed wake up call to the higher education community is needed. The data is clear. Students of color succeed when they see instructors who look like them. But at our nation's most prominent colleges and universities, faculty of color, are sorely lacking. This must change. So what's your immediate reaction to, to how she feels on the situation? Well, I think there's a truth in that, but I think also you have to start talking about how we get people into, uh, into being trained to be faculty. Okay. I mean, so, so for example, a psychologist, people say they want to be, you know, they want to have a PhD in psychology. And then the question is, do you really want that? And how do we help you understand what that's really going to take? Because mm -hmm. training is not going to change for you. The training is the training. Mm -hmm. uh, the theories are the theories. And you have to learn how to navigate all that. So how, how are we preparing people, uh, uh, people of color, other, uh, other representative uh, groups, to look at higher education in a way that is both a challenge and an adventure? Because you can't. it's not going to happen over. It can't happen overnight. If you can't suddenly have fat black faculty, right. how do you do that? How does that happen? Yeah. Uh, and, and the road, the route is a bit treacherous 
not for racial reasons, but because people have to focus in, have to understand what's about to happen. It's not that people don't have the ability, but some people are surprised, for example, about how much uh, it takes training in statistics to be a psychology professor. Mm -hmm. And people don't expect that. So we have to, we have to, we have to help people understand what it takes, what it really is all about. And not let people live in these fantasy ideas because when they, when they do actually try, they're going to be really upset because they didn't expect that. That's what my mentors did for me. They said, you're a great thinker, but look, here's what it takes. You got to learn this. You got to learn that. Uh, do you want to do that? Are you willing to do that? And so it's, it's two problems. Many universities have not figured that problem out uh, of how to change what's in, who's in the pipeline. Uh, and some universities don't care. Here's an interesting thing. This is invisible work. In the summers, pre-pandemic, I was always busy on campus, even though I don't teach in the summers. Why was I busy? There's the satellite camp that brings high school students to campus to, to see how STEM stuff works. But I was always the speaker at the banquet. And a mix of students, mostly first-generation students, which means a mix of Black, Hispanic, female uh, students, that mix of students they were bringing to campus to give to give them a better sense of what it takes, what is going on at a university. The other one is the African-American, what was it called? I forget. Uh, but it's 100 African-American students on campus from high symposium? school. Symposium? Uh, not symposium. No, 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 no. Uh, African-American academic something. Okay. Anyway, I don't know if it's still going on, but it would bring 100 African-American students to campus uh, who were juniors and seniors, uh, or maybe sophomores and juniors, to say, okay, this is, this is NC State. This is what goes on here. Uh, and this is what we work on, and this is what it can feel like. I always warned them because they asked me to speak to them. I said, okay, you're here in the summer. This is not how it works. Because when you come here in the fall, there are 35,000 people moving around. <laughs> yeah. Talk yeah. About. yeah. So you can't, you get, you got to get people realistic, a realistic view and understanding of what they're about to get themselves into. Otherwise they will fall apart. Yeah. And that's part of the, the, the thing that universities have to work on and that they haven't worked that much on. NC State does a pretty good job, uh, but there's got to be more of that. Uh, as well as rewarding faculty for all this invisible work. I just told you, I was here in the summer. And the only reason I do that, nobody, they don't pay me. The only reason I do that is because I feel a sense of responsibility. But not every, not every fa Black faculty member should be expected to have that sense of responsibility. We're not all the same. So it's a complex problem. Uh, it's a problem that needs work and it can work. I agree with what she said. There's a truth in it, but there's more to it. Okay. Okay. Great. All right, really quick, before we move on, I found it funny you mentioned um, the kind of reality check when school actually starts and there's 35,000 other people besides yourself. I, I'm a transfer student. My first, year, my first year here was my sophomore year, right? I spent my freshman year at uh, Wingate University. Okay. Now, as a sophomore, we were, we were actually right in the thick of COVID. Uh, it was fall 2020. Okay. So I didn't get that experience that year, but my junior year came around fall of 2021 and people are back on campus. And, you know, there's masks and stuff, but it's, it's people everywhere. The buses are crowded. I'm like, whoa, this is, this is, you know, what they were talking about. Just that it can be overwhelming if you don't come. Yes. Before. Yeah. Yeah. It can be overwhelming. Um, but, you know, I got used to it. You get used to it. It's oh. fine. It's, 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 um, I know it's a big institution, but it seems small now because of how used to it I am. But, but that um, takes time, doesn't it? Time it and experience. Time. Yeah, it takes time, especially when you come from uh, a smaller environment. Not only was my first university small, but I went to a small high school. I graduated with ninety six other people. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. you know, it was it was a it was a little. That shocking. is something. That is something the university has not made any attempts to deal with. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, nothing. That would help everybody. Mm-hmm. See, this is the problem with the way people focus on the way people focus diversity and inclusion ideas. They make them narrow. But I've always said, for example, that we should do programming for first generation students as diversity and inclusion. Why? Because it's going to be a mix of people, first generation. Likewise, uh, we need to do something to help students who come from really small places. Mm-hmm. It's also first generation, but really small. I had a student from, U- have you ever heard of Eureka, North Carolina? Eureka? Eureka. There's a town, Eureka, North Carolina. There's a reason you haven't heard of it. Population, 100. 100. 100. Wow. So I had a student in my social science class in Po 216, a class, a room that hosts 200 students. Yeah. yeah. Right. And we were, I, I was doing an exercise with them and talking about small towns, large towns. When we got to small towns, you know, people were saying 5,000 people. I said, that's not small. I said, less than 1,000. One, two, a couple of hands said, I said, less than 500. And only one hand <laughs> stayed up. <laughs> And I pointed to her, I said, so how's, what, what's the population of your town? And she said, 100 people. I almost passed out. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, you got to see me after class. The little white girl. The class is bigger than that, right? That's exactly the point. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> she was in a classroom with more people in it than in her town. It's crazy. Now, here's a complicating fact. Okay, that's that's tough enough, right? Turns out... <laughs> <laughs> oh, small town's conservative, right? Mm-hmm. She's lesbian. Oh, wow. she's lesbian and had never come out yet. Yeah, that's, see, that's 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 a huge step. Yeah, that's like holy shit, man. But you see, that's what's going on on our campus. There's all these kind of dynamics going on that the university has not found ways to begin to manage to help students. And that's why I teach the way I teach. Wow. Okay. Well, listen, we appreciate your transparency, your honesty, and just the, your voice on this call, the voice of power. And um, before I let you go, um, one thing that I like to do with the people that I interview, uh, we do this thing called top takes. And we just kind of really quickly, kind of on the spot answers, you think about, you know, the question and you give your answer related to you, just a way okay. to get to know you better. Sure. All right. So the first question is, your favorite food growing up was what? Gumbo. Gumbo. Okay. Gumbo. What is the most annoying thing? You guys are going to love this question. What is the most annoying thing someone has said to you about your height? <laughs> you know the answer. <laughs> so you play sports? So you play football? Shut the f- Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's been approached a, a lot. So, so exactly, no, if you don't mind, how tall are you? Six foot three. Six three, okay. Six three, two hundred and sixty five pounds, broad yeah. shouldered. Yeah, I'm a big, giant, scary black man. <laughs> <laughs> he loves to mention that at the at the beginning of every class. Um, cool, cool, cool. So, what is one career you would have pursued if you weren't a professor? Oh, that's interesting. Ah, uh, I don't know. If I was a professor, it'd be so- oh, writing. Okay. Right. Fiction. Fiction writing, okay. Um, wow, speaking of, what do you think is the hardest thing about writing? Oh, the two hard things. One is the idea. You have to have an idea. You have to have something to say. And two is focus. Uh, you have to, focus means discipline. Mm-hmm. You have to sit your butt down and write. And then last but not least, your favorite type of music. Ooh, are you gonna do me like that? Favorite <laughs> type of music. Favorite type. Ah, oh, I can't. Ooh, I can't. You I have really, artists, I can't or even a song. Oh, Pavarotti. Okay. Uh, Nessun Dome. That's opera. I mean, oh. I have wide range. Wide margin. Music. Yeah, that's why we had to, we had to <laughs> think about it. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. But Pavarotti always gets my heart. Yeah. The, the opera. Okay. Um, but I listen to a lot of different music. So if if, if you had ever t- if you took my class pre pandemic, you would realize I li- I use music in the classroom. I can't do it over Zoom. 
-hmm. but I use literally music, modern music, uh, all throughout the semester to talk about love and pain and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Man, I hate I missed it. But yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of the experience that I've had, you know, even over Zoom. Um, well, everyone, this is Dr. Rupert Nichols. Uh, I, hope, I hope you've enjoyed learning about him and hearing his experience, how he got to where he is today. I'm um, Dr. Nikos. We thank you for coming Let on. Let me say one thing before you shine off. Sure, sure. We talked about balance. Mm -hmm. One of the things that helps me is poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a poem I use, uh, I use and think of all the time about balance. Uh, Honor Bonton, Harlem Renaissance. We all not come to wage a strife with swords upon this hill. It is not wise to waste a life against a stubborn will. Yet would we die, as some have done, beating away for the rising sun, beating away for the rising sun. Man of wise courage and wisdom, man. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. Um, everyone, once again, feel free to look him up. He's all over Google. He's all over YouTube. You'll love to hear from him again, trust me. But um, we thank you, Dr. Nikos, for your time today and your words of encouragement and just your experience. And um, thank you for everyone for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed and we'll see you on the next one.